Uh, today, we are going to look at chapter three of the Rust Atomics and Locks book written by Mara Boss. Uh, in this chapter, we are going to go deep into memory ordering. Uh, my name is Anup Jadhav and I work at Salesforce. And these are some of my socials for Twitter, GitHub and LinkedIn. So here's the rough agenda. We'll start by looking at the memory model in detail. Um, then we'll explore the different ordering options like relaxed, uh, release and acquire, consume, and sequentially consistent. Uh, we'll also cover uh, atomic fences. Uh, then before wrapping up, we'll look at some common misconceptions around uh, memory ordering and then summarize it all. In the previous chapter, we saw that atomic types are types that can be accessed atomically. Uh, that is the value of an atomic type variable is written all at once in one single store. Uh, this guarantees that when this variable's value is read or loaded, it won't appear as if some parts have changed and others haven't. Uh, the CPU can uh, atomically access values of specific sizes. So there are only a handful of atomic types, all of which live in the std sync atomic module. Uh, each of these atomic types that you see here corresponds to a size that the CPU can handle atomically. And they differ based on attributes like whether the value is signed or whether it's an atomic use size or a pointer. Um, and the atomic types have dedicated methods for atomically loading and storing the values they hold and a few complex methods like swap and compare exchange. And we looked at these methods in detail in the previous talk. So if you want to learn more about them, uh, I'd encourage you to watch the talk on chapter two. We also covered this in chapter two talk, but let's remind ourselves how the compiler and the processor modifies our code. Both compilers and CPUs reorder the code we write if they think that it will lead to faster execution. Uh, they perform all sorts of tricks to make our programs run as fast as possible. Uh, if you take your processor, for instance, uh, if it figures that it can speed things up, it might reshuffle the code that you've written. Like if in one instruction is hanging around waiting for data from the main memory, the processor might say, hey, while we're waiting, why don't we knock out a few of these other instructions? Of course, it will only do this as long as it doesn't mess up what your program is supposed to do. And similarly, your compiler might rewrite parts of your program if it thinks it can speed things up. But just like the processor, it'll only do this if it doesn't change the way your program behaves. Uh, let's look at this example. Uh, here, the compiler might determine that the order of these operations does not matter because uh, nothing happens between these three add operations that depends on the value of uh, A or B. So, so it might reorder the second and third operations and merge the first two into a single addition. Then while executing this function uh, that's optimized by the compiler, the processor might decide to execute the second addition before the first addition. Because the value of B was, I don't know, you know, because it was available in an L1 cache, uh, whereas the value of A had to be fetched from the main memory. Uh, in this case, the end result stays the same. The value in A is incremented by two and the value uh, in B is incremented by one. The only situation where this is a problem is when we are mutating data that's shared between threads. And this is why we have to spell out uh, to the compiler and the processor the do's and don'ts with our atomic operation. Uh, because their usual way of thinking doesn't really consider how threads interact. They might do some optimizations and instruction shuffling that might end up changing the result of your program. And that's, that's not ideal. The real issue here is figuring out how we break the instructions down for the compiler and the processor. If we try to list out what is allowed and uh, what is not allowed when juggling multiple threads, we might end up making our concurrent programming uh, a heck of a lot more wordy and less fun and error prone and maybe even architecture specific. Instead, we specify a memory ordering represented by the ordering enum, which every atomic operation takes as an argument. Um, Rust gives us a pretty small menu of options and they have been carefully picked to fit most use cases well. The orderings are abstract and they don't directly reflect the actual compiler and processor mechanisms involved, uh, such as you know, instruction reordering. So this allows your concurrent code to be architecture independent 
and future proof. Uh, it also lets you verify the code without needing uh, intimate knowledge of the specifications of every existing and upcoming processor and compiler version. Uh, the available ordering enum variants you can see on the screen, uh, you have relaxed ordering, uh, release and acquire ordering, and acryl, um, and finally the sequentially consistent ordering. Uh, the relaxed ordering is the weakest, which means it provides the least guarantees, and sequentially consistent provides uh, uh, the most guarantees. Uh, there's also something called as consume ordering, uh, which has not been implemented in Rust, but we'll cover it in our talk so that we are, uh, you're aware of uh, what it does. So these memory ordering options are clearly and formally defined so that we are crystal clear on what we can and can't expect from it. And for the compiler writers to know precisely what guarantees they need to offer us. Uh, to decouple this from the details of the specific process architectures, memory ordering is defined in terms of an abstract uh, theoretical memory model. And this memory model is copied from C++. Um, rather than copy any existing processor design, it takes an abstract approach built around a strict set of rules. Uh, this rule set captures the shared characteristics of all present and future architectures. It also gives the compiler sufficient leeway to make useful assumptions when it's analyzing and optimizing programs. And it allows for, um, it allows for concurrent atomic stores, but considers concurrent non-atomic stores to the same variable to be a data race, which results in undefined behavior. However, on most process architectures, uh, there is actually no difference between an atomic store and a regular non-atomic store. And we'll talk about this more in chapter seven. Um, if, you, uh, if you believe that, then the, the bit about there's no difference between an atomic store and a regular non-atomic store, then you might argue that uh, the Rust memory model is overly stringent. But these uh, firm and formal guidelines simplify the process of uh, understanding a program for both the compiler and the programmer. Uh, plus, they create a bit of wiggle room for any future enhancements. The memory model primarily defines the order in which operations happen in terms of happens before relationships. Uh, this means that as an abstract model, it doesn't talk about machine instructions or timing or instruction reordering uh, or optimization, etc. But instead, it defines situations where one thing is guaranteed to happen before another thing and leaves the order of everything else undefined. Even though there is no global ordering of operations between threads, between different threads, there is a single total ordering within each thread, which is also known as its sequence. So you could say that in a single thread, one instruction is sequenced before or after another instruction. And the basic happens before rule is that everything that happens within the same thread happens in order. If a thread is executing F, then G, then F happens before G. And this is the strongest kind of ordering guarantee between any two operations and only possible when uh, those two operations happen one after the other and on the same thread. Between threads, these happen before, happens before relationships only show up in some special cases, like when you're spawning or joining a thread, or when you're locking and unlocking a mutex, or during atomic operations that don't use the relaxed memory ordering. Relaxed memory ordering is the most basic and also the most performant memory ordering that by itself never results in any cross-thread happens before relationships. Let's try and understand this by looking at an example. In this example, we assume that function A and function B are concurrently executed by different threads. In function A, we store values in X and Y. In function B, we load those values. And in both store and load operations, we use the relaxed memory ordering. As we said just now, the basic happens before rule is that everything that happens within the same thread happens in order. Now, because we use used relaxed memory ordering, there are no other happens before relationships in our example. So one possible execution is that either A or B completes before the other starts. So the output will be 
zero zero or ten twenty. Another execution uh, could be that uh, A and B run concurrently. Uh, it's easy to see how the output can be 10, 0. One way this can happen is if the operations run in this specific order. Yeah. Do you think this, this output is possible? It's a trick question. The answer is yes. It is a valid outcome, uh, even though there is no possible globally consistent order of the four operations that would result in this outcome. When step three is executed, there is no happens before relationship with step through step two, which means it could load uh, either zero or 20. When step four is executed, there is no happens before relationship with step one, which means it could load either zero or 10. Given this, the output 0, 020 uh, is a valid outcome. The, the important and uh, counterintuitive thing to understand is that step three, loading the value 20 does not result in a happens before relationship with step two, even though that value is the one, uh, or that operation is the one that's, uh, that, stored, uh, that, was stored, uh, that stored the value in step, step two. Our intuitive understanding of the concept of before starts to fall apart when things always happen in a globally consistent order, especially in cases where there's instruction reordering going on. A, a more practical and intuitive uh, but less formal understanding is that from the perspective of the thread executing B, operations one and two might appear to happen in the opposite, uh, in the opposite order. Uh, a few more things to note about happens before relationship. Spawning a thread creates a hap happens before relationship between what happened before the call to spawn and the new thread. And similarly, joining a thread creates a happens before relationship between the joint thread and what happens after the join call. Let's demonstrate it with an example. Here in the main thread, we store one in X. Then we call a thread spawn with function F. In function F, we load the value of X. And in the main thread, we update or store a new value in, of two in X. Then we join on the spawn thread. And after that, uh, we store three in X. Now, because of the uh, happens before relationship between three and one, we know that the store of one in X happens before the load from X in the spawn thread. But because there is no happens before relationship between three and two, there is no guarantee that the spawn thread will see the value of two in X. And because of the join, there is a happens before relationship between operations four and three and four and two. Okay, we've used RELAX a lot in our example so far. So let's look at it in detail and understand the guarantees that it provides. Atomic operations using relaxed memory ordering do not provide any guarantees on the happens before relationship, but they do guarantee a total modification order of each individual atomic variable uh, this means that all modifications of the same atomic variable happens in an order that is the same from the perspective of every single thread. What does that look like? So let's look at it, uh, explain this with an example. Um, here we have two functions, A and B. In function A, we are adding five and 10 to an atomic uh, I32 variable X using the fetch add atomic operation with relaxed memory ordering. And in function B, we are loading the value of X in four different variables, A, B, C, and D. Let's assume that both A and B are concurrently executed by different threads. Only one thread modifies X, which makes it easy to see that there's only one possible order of modification of X. It starts at zero and then becomes five and is finally changed to 15. Other threads, cannot observe any values from X that's inconsistent with this total modification order. This means that uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 5, 15, and 0, 15, 15, 15 are, the, are some of the possible results from the print statement in thread two. Whereas uh, an output of uh, 0, 5, 0, 15, or 0, 0, 10, 15 is impossible. 
And you can see this uh, uh, more clearly if you replace function A by two separate functions, A1 and A2, which we can assume are each executed by a separate thread. Assuming these are the only threads modifying X, there are now two possible modification orders, zero to five and then to 15, or zero to 10 and then to 15. Again, depending on which fetch add operation executes first. Uh, whichever happens, all threads will observe the same order. So even if we have hundreds or thousands of additional threads all running our function B, we know that if one of them prints a 10, the order must be 0, 10, 15, and none of them can possibly print a 5. A fascinating outcome of the rules of relaxed memory ordering is that it's hypothetically possible for values to come into existence from nowhere. Uh, basically, a value might show up even though it was never actually computed anywhere in the code. It's called the um, out of thin air or UTA problem. The lack of ordering guarantees around relaxed memory ordering can lead to some theoretical complications when operations depend on each other in a cyclic way. So let's look at this example to, to, to demonstrate this. So here we have two atomic variables, X and Y. We have uh, thread A loading a value from X, which is zero and storing it in Y. Then we have another thread, thread B, loading a value from Y which is also presumably zero and then storing it in X. Then we join the threads. And finally, we assert them, assert that both X and Y are zero. Now it's fair to assume that values of X and Y cannot be anything other than zero, right? That's because we only store values that were loaded from these same atomics, which are only ever zero. However, interestingly, this assertion might fail. In fact, the memory model technically allows for an outcome where both X and Y are 37 or 42 in the end, or any other value, making, making the assertions fail. Now, why is that? Let's, let's look at this visually. You have X and Y with an initial value of zero, and then threads A and B loading and storing the values. Given that there are no ordering guarantees, both threads might see the result of the other threads store operation. This can lead to a cycle in the order of operations. We store 37 in Y because we loaded 37 from X, which was stored to X because we loaded 37 from Y, which is the value we stored in Y, so on and so forth. I'll be honest, I didn't understand this reasoning when I read it in the book. So I went to the Rust forum and asked them if they could explain this differently. And the answer that I understood best was that in order to make the code performant or optimized, the compiler could speculatively assign a random value like 37 to Y if it believes that value to be likely based on some analysis. Uh, and this kind of optimization is done to improve performance. And if, if, th uh, if that happens to Y, if that value is assigned to Y, then you know, that value could also end up in X. In practice, Compiler writers don't do this, and therefore the code under consideration here is harmless. Now, fortunately, you know, the, uh, the possibility of such out of thin uh, error values is universally considered to be a bug in the theoretical model and not something that you need to take into account in practice. Now, there are some research papers written on this UTA values problem. If you're interested, you can find these papers online and try to go deeper. But for now, let's move on to release and acquire ordering. Usually, uh, release and acquire memory orderings work in tandem to establish a happens before relationship between threads. Release memory ordering applies to store operations and acquire memory ordering applies to load operations. A happens before relationship is formed when an acquire load operation observes the result of a release store operation. Uh, in this case, the store and everything before it happened before the load and everything after it. When using acquire for a fetch and modify or compare and exchange operation, it only applies to the part of the operation that loads the value. And similarly, release applies only to the store part of an operation. ACREL is used to represent the combination of acquire and release, which will cause the load to use acquire ordering and the store to use release ordering. 
As always, let's go over an example to see how that's used in practice. In this example, we send a 64-bit integer from a spawned thread to the main thread. Uh, we use an extra atomic Boolean to indicate to the main thread that the integer has been stored and is ready to be read. When the spawn thread is done storing the data, it uses a release store to set the ready flag to true. When the main thread observes this through its acquire load operation, a uh, happens before relationship is established between these two operations. It's represented better here in this visual. Uh, at this point, we know for sure that everything that happened before the release store to ready is visible to everything that happens after the acquire load. Specifically, when the main thread loads from data, at the variable data, we know for sure it will load the value stored by the background thread. And there's only one possible outcome this program can print on its last line, that's 123. If we had used relaxed memory ordering for all operations in this example, the main thread could have seen ready set to true while still loading a zero from data afterwards. In our example, the happens before relationship from the ready flag guarantees that the store and load operations of data cannot happen concurrently. This means that we don't actually need those operations to be atomic. Uh, in other words, we don't need to define the variable data type as, a, as an atomic variable. But if you try to use a regular non-atomic type for our data variable, the compiler would refuse our program uh, because Rust's type system doesn't allow us to change or mutate non-atomic variable in one thread when another thread is also reading from it because that's a data race. The type system doesn't understand the happens before relationship we've created in this situation. We need to use some unsafe code to assure the compiler that we've given this a good thought and are confident that we are not stepping on any rules. Let's dive a bit deeper to understand what we mean when we say that a happens before relationship is formed when an acquire load operation observes the result of a release store operation. Imagine that two threads, both release store is seven into the same atomic variable and a third thread loads a seven from that variable. Now, that, does the third thread uh, have a happens before relationship with the first thread or the second one? And that depends on which seven it loaded, you know, the one from the thread one or the one from thread two. This leads us to conclude that even though seven equals seven, there is something different about the two sevens from the, th from the two threads. The way to think about this is in terms of the total modification order that we talked about in relaxed ordering. Uh, uh, so this total modification order is the ordered list of all modifications that happens to an atomic variable. Another analogy, although it's not uh, it's probably incorrect, slightly incorrect, but close enough, is to think about all the changes that you've made to a file in a git commit. So if you replace file with an atomic variable and uh, the changes to all the changes uh, that happened to the variable, that's another way of looking at this. So even when the same value gets written to the same variable multiple times, every single one of those operations counts as a separate event in the, in the overall sequence of changes made to that variable. So when we load a value, the value loaded matches a specific point on this variable's timeline, which tells us which operation we might be synchronizing with. Uh, if, for example, if, we, if the total modification order of the atomic variable is, uh, is, is what you see on the screen, it was initialized at zero first, then uh, release stores uh, seven from thread two, then relaxed stores uh, value six, and then release store seven from thread one. Then acquire loading a seven would synchronize with um, either the release store from the second event or the release store from the last event. However, if we have previously uh, seen a six, the value six, we know that we are seeing the last seven and not the first one meaning we now have a happens before relationship with thread one and not with thread two. Now there's one more nuance to understand here, uh, which is that a release stored value may be modified by 
any number of fetch and modify and compare and exchange operations while still resulting in a happens before relationship with an acquire load that reads the final result. For example, let's say the atomic variable follows this order, uh, initialized at zero, then release store at uh, seven, relaxed fetch add, which will change the value to eight, then release fetch add, which will change the value to nine, then release store seven, and finally relaxed swap 10, which will change it from seven to 10. Now, if we acquire load a nine from this variable, we not only establish a happens before relationship with the fourth operation that, that stored this value, but also with the second operation, uh, which stored a seven, even though the third operation used a relaxed memory ordering. But let's say we acquire loaded a 10 from this variable, which was written by a relaxed operation here, then we establish a happens before relationship with the fifth operation, which stored a seven. Because that was the last store operation in the modification order, it breaks the chain. We don't establish a happens before relationship with any of the other operations. Now, when you're studying release and acquire ordering, you'll eventually come across mutexes as being the most common use case built using this kind of memory ordering. When something is locked in a mutex, it will use a, an atomic operation to check if it was unlocked using acquire ordering, uh, while also atomically changing the state to locked. When unlocking, it will set the state back to unlocked using release ordering. This means that there will be a happens before relationship between unlocking a mutex and subsequently locking it. Here's an example of this pattern. In this example, we have a function f that checks if locked atomic bool variable is false, then it sets it true only if it was false before, and then updates the variable data. After it has updated data, uh, it then stores false back in the locked variable. Finally, we spawn 100 threads in the main function and call the function f. Now notice that the variable data is static and mute, and we will be writing to this variable, and static mute variables can only be read or written in an unsafe block, which is what we're doing here. Compare and exchange operations take two memory ordering arguments, one for the case where the comparison succeeded and the store happened, and one for the case where the comparison failed and the store did not happen. In function f, we try to change locked from um, false to true, and only access data if that succeeds. So we only care about the success memory ordering. Uh, if the compare exchange operation fails, that must be because locked was already set to true, in which case F doesn't do anything. Therefore, we use the relaxed ordering for, uh, for failure order. But when we store the false value back in locked, we use release and therefore create a happens before relationship for the next thread trying to read the value in locked. Thanks to acquire and uh, release memory ordering, we know for sure that no two threads can now concurrently access data. Any previous access to data happened before the, the, the subsequent release store of false to locked, which in turn happened before the next acquire, compare, and exchange operation that changed that false to true which happened before the next access to data and so on and so forth. Uh, in chapter four, uh, we will turn this concept into a reusable type uh, called spin lock. Now, if you watched the previous talk on chapter two, uh, uh, chapter two, we've implemented lazy initialization of a global variable using a compare and exchange operation. Uh, let's do a quick recap. Uh, we have a key of type atomic U64 with an initial value of zero. We load the value into another variable also called key. We check if key is zero, if it is, then generate random key function, that, sorry, then call the generate random key function. Then compare exchange will only set the new key if the original value is still zero. If another th thread has changed the value of key to, or another val or the value was zero, then return the key. Because this value was a non-zero 64-bit integer, we were able to use an atomic uh, U64 to store it using uh, zero as the placeholder before initializing it. If you want to do the same for a larger data type that does not fit in a single atomic variable, we need to look for another solution. 
For this example, let's say we want to maintain the non-blocking behavior so that threads never wait for another thread, but instead race and take the value from the first thread to complete the initialization. This means we still need to be able to go from uninitialized to fully initialized in a single atomic operation. So here's how we do it. What we'll do here is add another layer of indirection because as we know, every problem in computer science can be solved by adding another layer of indirection. Now, because we can't fit the data into a single atomic variable, we can instead use an atomic variable to store a pointer to the data. In this case, we'll use an atomic pointer over type T, which is a raw pointer type, which can be safely shared between threads. Um, we are using a null pointer instead of zero as the placeholder for the initial state. We are loading the value into a variable called P. Uh, we can no longer use relaxed memory ordering here because uh, we're not only sharing the atomic variable containing the pointer, but also the data it points to. So we need to make sure that allocating and initializing the data does not race with reading it. So we need to use release and acquire ordering on the store and load operations. Now the compiler and the processor won't break our code by reordering the store of the pointer and the initialization of the data itself. If the pointer we acquire load from PTR is non-null, we assume that it points to the already initialized data and therefore we construct a reference to that data and return that. Uh, because we are doing this inside of an unsafe block, we put a safety comment here uh, that states our assumption that the data it points to has already been initialized because we are using a release and acquire memory ordering. If it's still null, uh, we generate new data and store it in a new allocation using box new. We turn this box into a raw pointer using box into raw, so we can try to store it in PTR using a compare and exchange operation. Uh, okay, if you, if you remember from before, compare exchange will return a result uh, either with an okay or an error variant. And in both cases, um, it will return the, the current value. So if, if the compare exchange operation returned an error variant, it means another thread won the initialization race and compare exchange failed because the pointer is no longer null. If that happens, we turn our raw pointer back into a box and deallocate, deallocate it using drop, avoiding a memory leak and continue with the pointer that the other thread stored in PTR. Now we are loading a potentially non-null pointer in two places uh, through the load operation and through the compare exchange operation when it fails. Uh, we need to use acquire for both the load memory ordering and the compare exchange failure memory ordering to be able to synchronize with the operation that stores the pointer. This store happens when the compare exchange operation succeeds. So we must use release as its uh, success ordering. Uh, this shows a visualization of the operations and the happens before relationships for a situation in which all three threads are calling get data. In this situation, thread one and two both observe a null pointer and they both try to initialize the atomic pointer. Thread one wins the rate, that race, uh, which causes thread two's compare and exchange operation to fail. Uh, thread, thread three only observes the atomic pointer after it has been initialized by thread one. The end result is that all three threads end up using the box that was allocated by thread one. And if you think about it in more practical terms, we could say that the release ordering prevents the initialization of the data from being reordered with the store operation that shares the pointer with other threads. Now this is important because uh, otherwise, other threads might be able to see the data before it's fully initialized. And we could explain the uh, acquire ordering as preventing the reordering that would cause the data to be accessed before the pointer is loaded. Again, that could lead us to you know, wonder that practically you'd always load the data before accessing it, right? How can we access data before its address is known? Um, we can therefore conclude that maybe something weaker than acquire ordering might suffice. And that something is called consume ordering. It's basically a lightweight, more efficient variant of acquire ordering whose synchronizing effects are limited to things that depend just on the loaded value. 
What that means is that if you consume load a release stored value X from an atomic variable, then basically that store happened before the evaluation of dependent expressions like you know, pointed to X or array of X or anything to do with X, but not necessarily before independent operations like reading another variable that we don't need the value of X for. The good news is that on all modern process architectures, uh, consume ordering is achieved with the exact same instructions as relaxed ordering. In other words, consume ordering can be quote unquote free, which at least on some platforms is not the case for acquire ordering. The bad news is that no compiler actually implements consume ordering because it turns out not only is the concept of uh, dependent evaluation hard to define, it's even harder to keep such dependencies intact when the compiler is transforming and optimizing your code. The issue gets even more complicated when taking control flow into account, like if statements, for statements, or function calls. Because of this, compilers upgrade consume ordering to acquire ordering just to be safe. In fact, the uh, C++ standard uh, explicitly discourages the use of consume ordering uh, because an implementation other than just acquire ordering turned out to be infeasible. It's possible that a workable definition and implementation of consumer ordering might be found at some stage in the future. Until then, um, Rust will not expose the consumer ordering to developers. The strongest memory ordering is sequentially consistent ordering. It includes uh, all of the guarantees of acquired ordering for loads and release ordering for stores and also guarantees a globally consistent order of operations. Uh, this means that every single operation that uses sequentially consistent ordering within a program is, is part of a single total order that all threads agree on. And this total order is consistent with the, uh, let me get this right. This, this total order is consistent with the total modification order of each and every individual variable. It's stronger than acquire and release memory ordering. Uh, sequentially consistent load or store can take the place of an acquire load or release store in a release pair, uh, release acquire pair to form a happens before relationship. Uh, in other words, an acquire load can not only form a happens before relationship with the release store, but also uh, with a sequentially consistent store uh, and similarly the other way around. But only when both sides of a happens before relationship use sequentially consistent ordering. Uh, it's guaranteed to be consistent with that single total order of, of sequentially consistent operations. Now, even though sequentially consistent ordering might seem like the simplest one to wrap your head around, it's hardly ever required in practice. Plus, uh, it can be a bit of a speed bump when it comes to performance. In majority of situations, uh, the good old acquire and release ordering should do the trick. But here's an example that uh, depends on sequentially consistent ordered operations. In this example, we are writing to a shared memory region concurrently from two different threads. Typically, such a scenario will cause a data race. We have two atomic bools, A and B, both set to the value of false. Then we define a static string variable, which is the shared memory region that we'll access from the two threads. We spawn a thread and store true in A with sequentially consistent ordering. Uh, oops, sorry. We were here, yeah. And then we load B in here using sequentially consistent ordering. And only if it's still false, we append an exclamation mark to the static string S. And then we spawn another thread and do the same thing, but in reverse for A and B. Yeah. Finally, we join the two threads. Uh, that is, we wait for them to be completed. And both threads first set their own atomic Boolean to true to warn the other thread that they are about to access the variable S and then check the other's atomic Boolean to see if they can safely access the variable S without causing a data race. If 
both store operations happen before either of the load operations, it's possible that neither thread ends up accessing S. However, uh, it's impossible for both threads to access S and cause a data race, which is an undefined behavior, because the sequentially consistent ordering guarantees only one of them can win the race. In every possible single total order, the first operation will be a store operation, which prevents the other thread from accessing S. And virtually all real world use cases of sequentially consistent involve a similar pattern of a store that must be globally visible before a subsequent load on the same thread. Uh, for these situations, uh, potentially more uh, efficient alternative is to uh, instead use relaxed operations in combination with a uh, sequentially consistent fence which we'll explore next. In, yeah, so in addition to operations on atomic variables, uh, there is one more thing that we can apply a memory ordering to, which is atomic fences. Okay, so what does a fence do? Again, typically when you specify an atomic operation like this, A dot store, uh, one with the release memory ordering, uh, here stores the atomic operation and releases uh, is the memory ordering. An atomic fence allows you to separate the memory ordering from the atomic operation. And this can be useful if you want to apply a memory ordering to multiple operations, or if you only want to apply it conditionally. So a release store can be split into a release fence followed by a relaxed store, and an acquire load can be split into a relaxed load followed by an acquire fence. Uh, using a separate fence can, can result uh, in an extra processor instruction, uh, which can be slightly less efficient. More importantly, unlike a release store or an acquire load, a fence is not tied to any single atomic variable. This means that a single fence can be used for multiple variables at once. The stood sync atomic fence uh, mod function, um, it, represents, uh, it, it represents an atomic fence and is either a release fence or an acquire fence or both acryl, or it can be, it can be sequentially consistent fence. Um, a release fence can take the place of a release operation in an happens before relationship if that release fence is followed on the same thread by an atomic operation that stores was a value observed by the acquire operation we are synchronizing with. And similarly, an acquire fence can take the place of any acquire operation if that acquire fence is preceded on the same thread by uh, any atomic operation that loads a value stored by the released uh, operation. And when you put this together, if any store after the release fence is observed by any load before the acquire fence, then a happens before relationship is created between the release fence and the acquire fence. So let's say we have one thread executing a release fence followed by three atomic store operations to different variables. And we have another thread executing three load operations from those same variables followed by an acquire fence. In this situation, if any of the load operations on thread two loads the value from the corresponding store operation on thread one, the release fence on thread one happens before the acquire fence on thread two. An offense doesn't need to be immediately before or after the atomic operations either. Uh, there can be other activities, even control flow uh, happening in between. We can make the fence conditional, uh, similar to how compare and swap operations have both a success and a failure ordering. And here's a good side-by-side -side comparison. On the left, left hand side, we are loading a loading pointer using acquire memory ordering. Then if the P is not null, it will print the data. On the right hand side, uh, we are using a fence to apply the acquire ordering only when the pointer is not null. Now this can be useful and more efficient if the pointer is often expected to be null and we avoid acquire memory ordering when it's not necessary. Let's explore a bit more complicated use case of release and acquire fences. Uh, in this example, we are writing to a static array of type U634 from 10 different threads. 
we start by declaring a non-atomic static variable called data. Uh, it's an array of size 10 that stores a U64. We create a const atomic bool variable called atomic false and a static array of atomic bools called uh, ready. Then inside the main function, we spawn 10 threads uh, that does some calculation and stores the result in the non-atomic shared variable data. Because data is static mute, we have to use the unsafe block to update it. Each thread sets the ready atomic boolean to true to indicate that the data is ready to be read by the main thread using a normal release store. The main thread waits for half a second. It checks all 10 booleans to see which threads are done and then prints the results that are ready. Now, instead of using 10 acquired load operations to read the booleans, the main thread uses relaxed operations and a single acquire fence. Uh, it executes the fence before reading the data, but only if there is uh, data to be read. Uh, in this specific case, maybe this kind of optimization is over the top, but this approach of reducing the extra load from additional acquire operations can be important when you're building highly efficient uh, concurrent data structures. And in addition to a uh, regular atomic fence, the Rust standard library also provides a compiler fence. Uh, its signature is identical to that of the uh, regular fence we discussed above, uh, but its effects are just restricted to just the compiler. Unlike a, a regular atomic fence, it doesn't prevent the processor from, uh, for example, reordering instructions. And in majority of cases uh, for fences, a compiler fence does not suffice. And we'll explore more about this topic in chapter seven. Uh, so just an FYI for now. Right, so there are a lot of misconceptions around memory ordering. So before we end this chapter, let's go over the most common ones. There's a common misconception that if you use a weak memory ordering like relaxed, changes to an atomic variable might never ever reach another thread or might only get there after a long delay. The term relaxed could give the impression that nothing occurs until something nudges the processor uh, to stop lounging around and get to work. In reality, the memory model doesn't specify anything about time. It only sets out the sequence in which certain events occur. It doesn't indicate how long you might be waiting for them. You know, if you imagine a hypothetical computer where it takes years for data to move from one thread to another, uh, and you'd probably agree that this computer is unusable, yet technically it could comply perfectly with the memory model. Both the compiler and the processor play a role in making things uh, happen in a different order than we might expect. And we looked at this in detail earlier. Turning off compiler optimization won't stop all possible tweaks that the compiler might make. Uh, and it won't switch off processor features that can still shuffle instructions around that could potentially cause issues. And third myth, you know, using a processor that doesn't reorder instructions means I don't need to care about memory ordering. Um, some basic processors, like the ones you might find in tiny microcontrollers, uh, have a single core that executes one instruction at a time, all in the sequential order. While it's accurate to say that these types of uh, devices have a much lower risk of facing issues due to incorrect memory ordering, it's still possible for the compiler to form inaccurate assumptions based on this flawed memory ordering, which could lead to broken code. And it's crucial to understand that even if a processor doesn't execute instructions out of order, it might still have other features that might affect uh, memory ordering. Next one is relaxed operations are free. Uh, whether or not this is accurate relies on your interpretation of free. Uh, it's true that relaxed is the most efficient memory ordering and it can considerably outpace the others. It's also accurate that on all current platforms, Relaxed load and store operations translate into the same processor instructions as non-atomic reads and writes. I, I was surprised by this. So if an atomic variable is only being handled by a single thread, 
uh, any speed difference with uh, the non-atomic variable is likely because the compiler uh, has more flexibility and effectiveness in optimizing non-atomic operations. Compilers generally steer clear of optimizing uh, atomic variables. But when the same memory is accessed by, let's say, multiple threads, it tends to slow down significantly compared to single thread access. So a thread is you know, constantly uh, uh, writing to an atomic variable will probably uh, observe a lag when other threads begin to frequently read the variable. As, um, and the processor cores and the cache will now have to work in concert. Uh, again, we'll look at this in detail in chapter seven of how that would work at the processor level. Next myth is sequentially consistent memory ordering is great default and is always correct. Now, if we leave performance issues aside, many do view um, sequentially consistent memory ordering as the ideal default because of its robust guarantees. Now, it's correct to say that if any other memory ordering is accurate, then sequentially consistent will be too. Now, this might lead to the impression that, you know, sequentially consistent uh, is always the right choice. But it's entirely possible for a concurrent algorithm to be fundamentally flawed, irrespective of memory ordering. And more importantly, when you are reading or reviewing code, uh, sequentially consistent basically tells the reader, this operation depends on the total order of every single sequentially consistent operation in the program, which is uh, an incredibly far reaching claim and very difficult to, uh, to review whether it's true or not. The same code would likely be easier to review and verify if it used weaker memory ordering instead. Uh, so it's always wise to treat sequentially consistent as a red flag. If you come across it, um, it usually implies that either something complex is happening or the author uh, didn't devote enough time to scrutinize the assumptions related to memory ordering. And both situations warrant an extra layer of scrutiny. Although we can substitute uh, sequentially consistent for acquire or release, uh, it can't magically manufacture an acquire store or release load. Uh, those simply don't exist. Release is only applied to store operations and acquire is solely used for load operations. Uh, for instance, a release store doesn't establish any release acquire relationship with this sequentially consistent store. If you, if you want them to be incorporated into a globally consistent order, then both operations will need to use sequentially consistent. All right, so that brings us to the end of our chapter on memory ordering. So let's summarize. There might not exist a globally consistent order for all atomic operations. And events may seem to occur in different, different sequence when viewed from the perspectives of different threads. Each individual atomic variable has its own total modification order, independent of the memory ordering. And this sequence is agreed upon by all threads. The order of operations is formally defined through the happens before relationships. Within a single thread, there is a happens before relationship between every single operation. Spawning a thread happens before everything the spawn thread does. Um, everything a thread does happens before joining that thread and unlocking a mutex happens before locking that mutex again. Uh, loading a value through an acquired load from a release store sets up a happens before relationship. This value can be changed by any amount of fetch and modify or compare and exchange operations. A consume load is a lightweight version of an acquire load if it existed. It's currently not supported by the Rust compiler. And sequentially consistent ordering results in a, in a globally consistent order of operations, but is almost never necessary and can make code review more complicated. And finally, fences allow you to combine the memory ordering of multiple operations or apply memory ordering condi conditionally. Okay, so that concludes the chapter on memory ordering. Uh, I think this chapter and the previous chapter uh, requires multiple reads to understand the fundamentals of atomics. It's worth it though, because if you understand this, 
the rest of the book will be easier to understand, except chapter seven. I think chapter seven is a key that will unlock a lot of these advanced concepts uh, and things will fall in place once we cover chapter seven. Um, again, I'd like to reiterate that you should support Mara's work by buying a copy for yourself. Thanks again for your time and your attention. Uh, I'll take questions now. I'll try my best to answer them. Thank you. Amazing job. I know that is a tough chapter to cover. <laughs> um, yeah, any, any questions? Or just comments or like what other people thought of the book? I have one question, if it's okay. Yeah. Um, sure, yeah. Uh, first of all, yeah, thanks for the amazing presentation, Nalo. Uh, yeah, it's been wonderful. So my question is, can you share the slide again, maybe? Um, goes to the happen before uh, slide, if that's possible. Um, or... Slide number 51, let's see. Happens before. Um, Okay, let me go back to the happens before bit. Yeah, let me share that here. Play this again. One, one second. All right. Yeah, this thing. Yeah. Uh, so here, uh, my understanding is like the the happens before is uh, given for inside a single thread, correct? So F uh, will always happen before G. So I have a couple of questions, both are like related maybe. So first question is, uh, does this does this ignore the compiler and CPU optimization you were talking before? Like still compiler or uh, CPU can run G before F, right? Or it's not possible at all. So remember, we're talking about memory ordering. So we are talking within the context of memory ordering. So if you have specified a memory ordering for something within the same thread, these operations will happen uh, in sequence. If it's a non-atomic variable without any memory ordering, then this compiler and the, uh, the processor could still do optimization. Okay, so, but, but, yeah, so, so considering this F and G is, let's say, modifying some atomic variable, right, with uh, some memory ordering, so the compiler will not uh, reorder this thing. That's, that's, that's the it. idea, yeah. That's okay. why we are okay. providing instructions, telling the compiler, don't touch this, or do it in a specific manner. Okay. Makes You're establishing what happens before relationship, and which is what we talk about with the different ordering options. Okay, thanks. So that is one more question, which is related to this one. Can you also go to this... Uh, uh, slide where we have this uh, re release acquire thing, uh, where we have this ready rule. Okay, let me go. I'm sorry, this. I didn't. I don't know that slide number. No, it's um, release acquire. Uh, what's the question though? So the the question is uh, the uh, I remember you were saying like two possible output, one is uh, 168 or something, another is zero. So um, I think that was this for loop where this ready bowl has been checked and uh, the for loop only comes out when the bowl is set to true uh, mm -hmm. yeah. and then we print That's that value. Yeah. If right. I happen, yeah. yeah. This one? Um, yes, correct. So, yeah, so my question is particularly like, uh, you said there is still a chance uh, the data, the, the last print can do a value of zero, correct? No, I didn't say that. I think I said the output will always be 123 here because okay. we've established an acquire release between the two. Oh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Okay, so you said like when we do, instead of acquire, if you use relaxed, then it can result in zero, right? Yes, that's right. If it's a relaxed ordering, mm -hmm. then there are no guarantees between threads. Okay, so that, that's where my question is. So let's say we use relaxed ordering here, right? So mm -hmm. assuming this first thread uh, where has the uh, happens before within this two uh, steps like data store and ready dot store. So we've so whenever we know that ready dot store happened, we can always say 
that data dot store also happened correct mm -hmm. even with the last that's, offering that's no. right yeah uh, not when you're observing it from a different thread so that's that's the key bit it's just because it's consistent within one thread doesn't mm -hmm. mean the other thread observes it in the same order if it's between two different atomic variables that's mm -hmm. why you need it to be released and acquire as a pair um because if you had both your um data.store one two three relaxed and ready.store true relaxed then even though on the thread that's doing the store mm -hmm. it's always doing the data store before the ready store there's the other yeah. thread won't necessarily observe that in the same order. So you can think Fine. of it as different threads that have that aren't going necessarily going to synchronize the information across because within, you know, there's cores, then there's caches. Yeah, the caches, right. Caches get synchronized across them. So there's no there's no guarantees unless the um, processor has formally given you those guarantees using um, atomic memory ordering. So just just looking at the step like where println happens, the data dot load, we cannot say the ready uh, has happened. Uh, yeah, whatever the order between this data or ready in the other thread. Yeah, so even only though only on your current thread is it consistent unless you've specified some ordering. Yeah, yeah, it, it yeah, <laughs> it's making like really uh, difficult to think about this particular one because when the while loop comes out only if the ready store is true, and then suddenly still data can load zero. Just kind of like counterintuitive, so yeah. But thanks for clarifying. Makes sense. Yep. Yeah. yeah, this chapter is tough, and like I, I feel like I, you know, I've read, I've reread certain sections several times, and I think it's going to take like coming back, um, a few more times. In particular, like fences, I would say is the bit that have it it hasn't clicked in my brain yet because uh, I me, haven't used them. <laughs> for me, fences was the easiest one to wrap my head around. Because that's the thing I was kind of thinking about in terms of fences. Like if you've got if you start a fence here and then uh you have another fence with the um for example release and acquire you have release friends, acquire friends. And if anything anything observes a result from the other side then that means there is a happens before relationship between the two. I think that one was for me the easiest. But what's a bit easier. weird? The, bit that has... the compiler, you can, compiler can reorder instructions across a fence. So when you have a fence, anything before it can be reordered, anything after it can be reordered, but nothing can before between. it can be reordered after the fence or vice versa. Yeah, That's it's what the, a fence is for. It's the, um... I, I know it's just that I need to, to read the docs more carefully, but it's, it's, the, it's the fact that acquire normally, I think of acquire as being like, um, you know, you make sure that everything before, oh, maybe it's fine. Ah, I'll, I'll reread it. But yeah, the, I found the C++ docs on this stuff actually quite helpful once I'd read the book. I've read them before and been like, I don't understand this. And then now that I've read the chapter in the book, they're uh, starting to make more sense. So. I think an another resource to read would be um, a Nomicon written by Sabrina Jusen, I think. And I'll find a link to that. Uh, she's written a great chapter on memory ordering and she's got a different, well, Sabrina's got a different view on um, look, a different way to look at uh, how memory is accessed. So uh, in that Nomicon, uh, Sabrina talks about how memory is accessed in a standard fashion, you know, in the non-atomic way. And then she brings in um, memory ordering to then talk about uh, the different ordering stuff. Uh, and it's a different way of looking at uh, the memory ordering concept uh, than what we find in Mara's book. So yeah, I'll try to find a link to that. I, I find the naming of the orders confusing. Like, why is it called acquire? Why is it called a release? Why is it releasing? Why is it acquiring? I, I, I've never understood that. And why is it a release with a store? What happens if you put an acquire with a store? I, I, th I think I, I, I am too tired to process this right now because I've had a full day of work. But I, I think I, I, I need to look at um, understanding for first what could go wrong if you don't have these me memory ordering. What is the problem that these are, are trying to solve, and then and then and then actually see what does the compiler actually do with these memory ordering? What instructions is it inserting? What is it avoiding? What is it doing? Uh, uh, before I, I can wrap my head around it, 
I think. I think one thing that really helped helped me is once I realized that if you only have one atomic, relax is fine. That's you know, one atomic, no bother. It's only the interplay between atomics that you care about um, a choir release. That's that's like yeah. you know, the first thing to to handle. And then the, in terms of the naming, I think of it as like release releases all of the results of the previous bits of code on its own thread. So, you know, if I'm storing a seven, then I'm releasing that seven, but I'm not only releasing that seven, I'm releasing everything that's happened before to make sure like that flash. all of that memory floods into the other threads. Um, like yeah, really, pardon? Like flush. Like a flush, yeah. Um, and then acquire is like, okay, I'm gonna take everything that has been released from something else and pick it up. Um, so if it's acquiring the same atomic, then it's gonna pick up everything that that atomic released. Um, so when you release can... it, you're like saying to other threads, okay, I'm now ready for someone else to read this value. Not this value. If it, so you're saying, I, I want everything else that happened before to also get picked up. That's... Okay, right, right. So the, the analogy that I keep coming back to is the git commit thing. So if you have a, or branches in, in git is, I think of these different release or whatever as a branch. So it's about synchronizing, you're checking out which branch you're checking out from or synchronizing with. And if you synchronize with branch A, then everything, all the changes in that branch, you're taking those. And I know it's not exactly the same, but uh, that's the mental model I use is release store. So I've released it here and my choir has synchronized with you. So I should see everything that has happened before. Uh, this release store. That's how I think about it. Okay. And if anyone hasn't read the chapter four, this is like your first foray into this stuff. Like, don't feel like you need to understand it day one. I definitely feel like every time I think I get it, <laughs> I, I will. I will be reading, reading, it, reading this chapter and the previous chapter a couple of times, more times at least. It, there's also a chapter in Rust of Rustation, Rust for Rustations, um, about all this uh, in the concurrency of par parallelism, chapter ten. It, it covers that as well. So um, this, this is a exceptionally good book to get if if, if you've read read the originally the book and you, you've done some basic initial Rust programming and you don't know what to do next pick up this book. Um, this is by John Jensetz, who does lots of really, really cool videos on YouTube. And he, 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 then, he then talks about more intermediate to advanced stuff in Rust. So he, he covers the concurrency stuff. He covers async await. He covers um, error handling, macros, testing, all, 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 this, all the unsafe code. It's just lots of really good stuff in that book. Yeah, talked about maybe doing it for a book club as well. So after after we finish this, yeah, one, it might I, be the natural one to pick up. Well, I think I was going to suggest it for the, the next book to do. Nice. Does anyone have um, any more questions? If not, I'll share um, what we've got coming up. No. Or like any more thoughts on it? I don't want to, yeah, I know this is a heavy chapter. <laughs> You did so well, and it does that. That was awesome. That was really, really impressive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, if anyone hasn't been to the previous meetups, we have covered a few things before, nothing like today's depth, um, but fearless concurrency for going over like async away and the various, or well, interact to async as well for going through various. Um, kind of the way you're more likely to interact with a lot of this stuff is through um, kind of wrapped APIs and things. But we also had an introduction to Atomics and then we have both one from way back when, before we'd read this book and we have last week's meetup. Um, we also have uh, one on smart pointers. And then coming up on the 14th of June, um, we've got chapters four and five on spin locks and channels. Um, so we've combined those two. They are really nice, um, more hands-on, chapters that kind of bring together a lot of the things you know the the prerequisites we've covered in the last three chapters and then actually putting them into use in a way where now like we're confident that we're doing things the right way um then in chapter six uh building our own arc just the atomically referenced counter type that you've probably used a lot 
Um, and then 12th of July, Chris is going to do a talk um, just on like insights on concurrency more generally. So this is not part of the book club. This is just kind of a step, a step back, talking more about um, concurrency or broader picture. And yeah, and then we've got some additional talks lined up coming up. So I'll reveal those when I've got the dates confirmed. Um, but yeah, I've got some exciting stuff lined up. External speakers. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming and the grand applause to Anna again. That was that was awesome. Um, Thank you. Yes, great talk. Thanks, Anna. Great talk. Great talk.